Okay, yeah, the next session. Uh, welcome, Fuad, with uh, the making of SEED. Hello, welcome everybody. My name is Fuad, I'm from Munich. I'm working as a lead effects artist at Tech Sponsor. We are a small CG studio and uh, do stuff like this. Thank you very much. So yeah, this was a little bit of our work that we did in the recent time. And today I want to talk about a short movie we recently did. Um, it's called Seed. And uh, basically it's a free project where we just said, okay, no clients, no briefing, no restriction, nothing. We just do what we ever wanted to do. And um, the main goal was actually to uh, improve our technical skills, our visual skills, and just do what we always wanted to do. Yes. and. Um, the briefing. Basically, I just first show the movie so everyone knows what I'm talking about.
Yes, uh, three and a half minutes of pure freedom, no clients. And um, the briefing was this. This was the real briefing folder. We have our own folder structure for jobs and that really, really was the briefing folder. So, of course, when you have uh, all the freedom, so where to start, what do you do? I mean, everyone wants to do something and the other one wants to do something different. And then, so, of course, we started uh, searching for references and uh, everyone just collected wildly and completely without any restriction in his uh, in the head just uh, search for reference images and styles and moods that he always wanted to do that he's interested in so we got lots and lots and lots of pictures I don't know maybe 2500 pictures in one folder and then um, of course you have to filter them and sort them in any case and then watch them and meet and these were just this is a random selection of of those uh, images like I said and um, I don't know what, what, what that was. So let's try it again. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. So where we left off it here. Now we've been there. Alright, so let's try it again. Images and images and images. Oh my god. I don't know why this happens, but just go there. Yes, I just skipped one slide. I don't know what happened. So, um, yeah, sorry for that. Um, so basically, what we did then is just uh, filter that uh, images and and sort it in sort in, in in terms of themes and topics and styles. This, for example, is some reaction diffusion images that uh, one of our um, Manuel actually uh, built in Houdini that we then tried. And then uh, this was some ISO levels that I built in Houdini. And we just um, sorted them, like I said, like build themes of it, and then like uh, models, human actors, and then landscapes. And in the end, we ended up like uh, having fluids in, in one sheet. And this was in the, in the end the, the main um, rounding theme of that movie that we said we want to have one theme that is covering the whole story, sort of. And then uh, after having all these images uh, collected into these themes, we just started doing uh, straight right off the bat. We started doing R and D and layouts immediately in 3D, and then uh, some a lot of these uh, R and D didn't make it into the movie, and uh, some of them did. So yeah, we just played around some R and D phase that everybody wanted always to have, like weeks of doing anything you like and um, just trying out things. And this, for example, was some uh, Boolean operation and dynamics test, some circle packing algorithms, all done in, in Cinema 4D in this case. And um, one sort of this actually made it into the final movie. And then this, for example, did, didn't make it into the movie, even if it was like two weeks, I think, of work or something, or completely full uh, modeled. And yeah, you can see the, the whole room and shaded in different styles. And, and everything so we just uh, this also doesn't <coughs> didn't um, well shown in the movie some spider web kind of renderings and cloth simulation styles and then another one which got out uh, left on top is some some hair polygons torus I don't know how to call it and then on the right some sand rose and some weird stuff on the left and then also some hair experiments like a I don't know how to call it, glass, hair, polygons, I don't know. And then again, some other stuff um, that we just tried out. And um, yeah, and then we kept on doing things and doing things and trying things. This, for example. Oh, <clears throat> That's pretty annoying. Yeah. I'm going to switch to my laptop, maybe try this <laughs> and hope that the cue is not. 
to this HDMI cover in here, Chris. Okay, I've got some battery left on my laptop, so I hope. Oops. Yeah. I'm sorry for this, guys. I don't know what's. right here and go to the right um, right sheet this was it so I hope the batteries uh, over survive this so yes uh, this is where we left off so uh, in the right top this for example we, we uh, took into the movie and then the other one too a sort of different version of that made it into the movie and so um, after doing all these weeks and weeks of R&D and stuff, and here you can see the shells, which were kind of, then we changed into the, 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 the style, into the movie, and um, then at any point, of course, you have to decide, okay, that's like six weeks, or I don't know how many, four weeks of R&D and playing around, and then at some point where you have to say, okay, now let's start with the production, with the actual one, because otherwise you just keep on playing and playing, and anyone does anything, and just doesn't, never end, so. Um, and then uh, what we did recently more and more for clients was like photo scanning for products and stuff and then we just wanted to take the next level regarding that photo scanning stuff so um, before that project we just scanned object uh, like for everyone of you knows photo scanning right you just walk around with a camera take photos of a geometry of some object and then you reconstruct it in the computer so what we did before was like we put something on, on, on a table or on a stick glued it on a stick and then walked around that object and then built the, the camera and everything else from this rotation photography that we did but then uh, in, in inside seat we um, this time reversed the rotation matrix and uh, built a small motor. Uh, we, we bought a small motor w which basically rotated the object and the guy taking the photograph, the images, can, could stand still, which made it a lot easier for the software to, to recompute because in this case, when you, when you walk around, you have in, in every image you have different backgrounds, which makes it a little bit uh, tedious for the, for the scanning software to figure out all the parallaxes and the distances and everything. And then uh, we went over to to this, and when you watch closely, you can see the little shell rotating a little bit every f I don't know three seconds or something like five degrees, and then you keep on just taking pictures of from bottom and the middle and above and and even more above, so you have like three or four floors of rotating pictures around the object, and then you end up with something like this. And we do all the photo scanning resolving in, in a software called Agisoft PhotoScan. There are some others too, but this is what worked best for us until now. And then you can see the, the, the blue um, little um, planes are the, are the photographs that are solved by the, by the software. And then uh, you took about, I don't know, in, the, in general we, took about, we take about 100, 150 or up to 200 uh, images of something, of an object, and then that gets all like calculated by the parallaxes there's some triangulation algorithms that's done by the software and then after this step what you see here is basically these are points this is not a image this is a dense point cloud it's called dense point cloud so basically in the first step you just build a point cloud out of this uh, uh, computation and then in the second step this is what we see here you have a really dense point cloud with a lot of lot of points and, and already the vertex colors uh, saved into the points, into each point. And um, then you have the surface reconstruction by the Delaunay triangulation, which builds a, a mesh, like by connecting these points. And this is a really high resolution, extremely high poly dense mesh, like it can have up to 200 million polygons or something, which of course makes it extremely hard to work with. But then in the next step you do like clean it up, do the retopo in any software and then get it back again to 
because basically you can use this including the the the, the, the texture that is um, output by the software basically for work I mean you can you can it's it's ready for work so you can use it but it's not really handy first of all you don't have any UVs of your object you get a, something like a, it's called texture atlas where you have really a chaos of little pieces of texture that the camera solves and then instead of using that we export this mesh and export the diffuse map and then do the ray topo in any software and then you can in Agisoft re-import re it back again and then with the UVs and the clean mesh with the nice loops and the nice mesh you can just reproject that usual uh, the, the, the original textures and the, the images that you had onto the new mesh with the proper UVs so this for example would be the high-res mesh plus this what I call the texture atlas and then instead of using that we just clean it up and then re-import it back into the photo scanning software put the textures on top of it and then you get some proper UVs and proper textures and this is what we keep on working then with so by doing this of course at a, after a certain time we get a lot of we had a lot of objects and a lot of uh, shells basically and then we build a library out of it and this is only three sheets of that library where you can see the different states like from far left there's the original photo of that um, of the object and then we convert it to a tiff because we get raw data out of the camera and then it's the the blue ones are the agisoft meshes and then after retopologizing everything we have the asset status that we call it and then the texture status with the uvs and then this for example is only the shells and it starts at a and goes to z obviously and this is only a small portion of it so this is the 3d objects library that we had for that movie we also had like i don't know what fruit and fish and, and other objects and even stuffed animals and everything so this was the uh, object part then we always wanted to do it with humans too but the problem with humans is of course obviously humans move and uh, the camera calibration can't work with with moving objects because because the software just can't solve it so even if it's a tiny little bit of movement in in your eyes or, or no no human unless it's dead does does move so it's just impossible for the software to, to solve that so, so camera, cameras and then we needed something different and then uh, one of our uh, freelancers he know a guy he knows a guy in Nuremberg who has a, a, a photo scanning studio rig which looks like this and he has like 64 DL, DSLR cameras around in, in this rig and then uh, you just go in there and he hits the button and all the 64 cameras are synced to each other and take one image at one time and then like with these uh, 360 degrees uh, positions and then you get something like <coughs> this on the left you can see the images like this guy uh, this girl standing on the tripod uh, holding the tripod on the tripod and then right, right on the right there's this dense mesh that we see from Agisoft and then of course you have to do some cleanups and everything but that doesn't matter at least I mean you can see the details even in her trousers and her blues and then the hair and then the, even the eye wrinkles are there and stuff and it's extremely high detail so again you do all the retopo and the UVs the proper mesh to have a proper mesh <coughs> and then what you do then is when you have this you have two things one is the high polygon high res 20 million polygons um, photo scanning mesh model and you have that extreme low res uh, retopologized um, base mesh so to say and what you do then is you just uh, subdivide and subdivide and again subdivide this new retopologized low res mesh to have more information than the retopo itself has and then you reproject that low res mesh onto the high res mesh so um, this was done in ZBrush with the Z Z ZBrush reprojecting um, tool and what you get then is out of the difference out of these both you can uh, export a displacement map which you can use then on your low, lower res mesh for displacing it later on and then uh, this for example is the reprojection state of this character 
and then of course you lose a little bit of weight uh, of detail but uh, you can add that simply either, uh, either by hand as we did here plus uh, on a finer level for example in her face by taking a high pass filter of the displacement map and then use it on top of a little to get a little bit of bump and, and even more detailed texture onto her face in this case. So the problem with this is when you export a diffuse map in even okay while taking these pictures in the studio you try to eliminate all kinds of reflections because specular specular reflections is very uh, bad for the for the software you just can't handle specular reflections so it has to be pure white to eliminate all this um, specularity but even if you have this indirect light that you have at the scanning studio or at the scanning situation you always have some shadows anywhere some like next to your nose, behind your ears and in this eye wrinkles. So it's just impossible to eliminate all shadows. But basically what you want to have is no shadows in your diffuse map. It's called, this is called the, what they call it, albedo map. And to get that albedo map, so basically if you have these shadows on the diffuse and then you put it onto the model and then you do some more lighting and, and shading, you get even more shadows. That's called a double shadow problem. And to eliminate these shadows, we just took the, the original mesh that we had and then uh, Manuel was on set in the studio and he took an HDRI of that studio and we just put a, put a pure clay material onto the model and then rendered it out again to get exact the same shadows as we had, as we had in the photographing situation. Everyone can follow? Yes sir. Alright, cool. And then after this, you just multiply these two, basically you subtract these two from each other to eliminate all kinds of shadows to get this, what is called albedo map, without any shadows on the diffuse part. So, and then when you have this diffuse texture, you can then, of course, work in light and light and, and shade in everything without having these double shadows. So, um, next was the hairdress, this Indian feather crown of the actress. Okay, we had the scanned object and we had the scanned human, the actress. And then again, we had some references that we collected. <coughs> and we had this shell selection, like I don't know how many of it, 60, 70, 80. And then we just start again from scratch, like building, testing, designing it basically. And this is in no way, uh, you uh, procedural or anything this was just like really placed by hand basically each shell of course you can start with a MoGraph cloner or something but in the end it looks just like a MoGraph cloner so we decided to do to place it all by hand and these some um, are some more ZBrush sculpting shell tests and some variations of it and uh, here some more variations Basically, the first two images look exactly the same, but they're not. You can see it if you look at the angle of the top shells on her head. That's going straight upwards on the left one and on the right. And you can see that the right one is a little bit, in the middle one is a little bit different. And then after doing like, I don't know how many iterations and tests and uh, yes, design steps, we had the final dress. So this is the final step of it. So landscape, the landscape basically plus this tape machine was the only two objects that were not photo scanned for this project. Obviously a landscape is very hard to, to scan and we couldn't fly over Iceland for a free project. So um, again, start with references and we wanted to have some Scottish island, Iceland uh, style of mountain with some moss growing overhead, maybe a lake with in between. For that we use Work Machine, it's a beautiful tool, all procedural, no paste, which is basically a Perlian noise where you multiply noises on top of each other and this gives you displacement textures at which you can use to displace your, tech, uh, your geometry basically. And then these are first tests out of Work Machine directly. Then it, it has some natural phenomena like uh, terracing where over the years and years and hundreds of years all these layers of st 
stones and I don't know how to call it in English, like on top of each other are layered and then you get this terracing or you have erosion or flow where it's like one thousands of years of water raining down and then you get the, basically what it does is a real fluid simulation, a 2D fluid simulation to mimic this. So this is not a fake, this is actual flowing down the, the geometry basically inside the world machine. So the cool thing about it is, is it can export any kind of map that you need. So basically here we see two diffuse maps. In the middle it's the height displacement, height, no, no, height, and um, the specular and the flow map for example. And you can put out just everything you need for your further texturing or workflow, whatever pipe, whatever it fit in your pipeline. And this for example is our Arnold shader work for one of the landscapes. And you can see in this um, pink notes there's some this specular weight on the left. Down, uh, bottom and then like the re reflow alpha in the middle and yeah whatnot this is just a Arnold shader tree that for example the top part is the beauty part and the lower part is the displacement which makes the height hey, height and um, what work machine does it works in, in tiles because you have such a terrific data that you put over your network because you have terabytes and terabytes and terabytes because it's so high detail, you get such a high detail out of this machine, uh, out of the software that you have terrific data that you have, you have to handle. And it's just almost impossible to do all these landscape at once. And I don't know how many terabytes we have for this landscape, but what World Machine does, it, it uh, splits it into parts, which is called tiles that we can see here. And then inside cinema, what we had is basically Right down, you can see the, 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 the tiles. We see like two tiles in a row and then like three to the back. And then what, what happens and what is actually rendered then in Arnold is the red plains. What you see, the mountains, they are not rendered. This is just for, uh, uh, for the viewport visualization for like flying over, use the, the, placing the camera. And this is a low res version of it and the high res is inside the displacement texture and what Arnold really uh, there's some cool feature inside Arnold which is called uh, the dot TX textures it converts it to a sort of delayed load shading mechanism which makes it uh, possible for the software to look in, in uh, to look on render time what it really needs in terms of geometry so it looks what what kind uh, what bucket is rendering right now so it only loads that part into the into the ram in, into the <coughs> memory that it really needs for rendering so uh, this is all done by displacement and like i said the white mountains are only low res resolution uh, visualization uh, for visualization purposes but you because you can't uh, work on planes obviously so and then next step was to create a crater and what we did here was um, we wanted to have this kind of circle packing that I showed in the beginning to redo inside the movie. So what we did here was take the same analogy of the circle packing mechanism and pull out some circles that we had before in 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 one in a cube inside Cinema, and then we exported the height map out of height map <laughs> out of it. You can see it on, on top on the left top and imported that into a work machine, built that mesh out of it and then it builds all these erosion and, and flow maps that you can see on the right on top of it and re-imported that back into Cinema 4D for using it for rendering and scene assembly and some moss on it. So this is the final crater that you see with the cube in the middle and then inside we had a lake which takes me to fluids and Houdini. So this is the next step, the Houdini Lake. Um, of course, I, I first uh, did some a little, uh, a lot of R and D regarding the density, depth, and water shading and whatnot, and then surface only, then volumes. But what I always never liked about these ocean surfaces in general, and water surf surfaces, is that it's it has only one resolution. Well, when you really look close to an ocean surface or, or a sea or a lake or something, you can see that it, it has parts of where, it, like windy parts, where the resolution is much denser, where you have these kinds of ripples and next to it, it's like very calm. And I tried to recreate that in Houdini. And thanks to attributes, 
we could do that. <laughs> so uh, I built a custom multi-resolution surface, so to speak, because I urgently wanted to have these kind of different resolutions on the surface. And um, you can easily do that by attributes because it's just attributeful. <laughs> yeah, I, I could talk for hours about attributes in Houdini because it's the best thing you can have. So, so here you can start to see what it looked like. If this is a preview quick uh, mantra test. And then um, in the end we had something like this where you can see it in the reflection of the sun. And this is what I wanted to have because this always bothered, uh, bothered me in, in these like ocean surfaces. And this makes it a lot, a lot uh, more realistic, of course. And of course, it's only a test where I just put some noise in it. But later on, I decided I could paint basically literally where I wanted these kind of resolution and where not. Uh, so I ended up uh, having four different resolutions. Plus, on top of it, I exported some uh, foam attributes and cusp attributes and whatnot attributes uh, for additional like surface displacements to have ripples there and not here and on the top, on top of each wave and, and on the cusps parts and stuff. So um, yes, this is basically one image. So for example, here's the foam attribute. You can see then on the on some parts we have got some more blurriness and then other parts not. And then some more denser mesh and not so dense mesh. So just for the variation and more reality. Next was the tape machine, also not photo scanned, completely modeled. <coughs> so we took we had the machine in the office. Then uh, our guy Leo t took some photos and started to model from scratch. So we did one cube, another cube, and another cube, and also some circles, and uh, put some shaders on it. And finally, had something like this, and we were like, oh wow. So, um, yeah, completely shaded, completely uh, fully modeled, high resolution, of course, and um, all these textures had up to 8K, I think, because we wanted to make sure we can really do like close-ups of everything because we had no cameras defined yet. The, all this was done using Octane. We have like, I don't know how many, I think it's eight, six or seven or eight GPU machines with like Titans in it or GTX 980s where you can really pump out the renderings like one and out after the other and it takes just seconds to visualize, uh, to, to see what you do, which is great for this kind of stuff. Yeah, this is a close-up rendering. Then uh, we have this silver fluid running over her face in the end, over the actress. And first I did some uh, fluid sim tests, especially regarding UVs, because this is all, always a little bit tedious to, to put uh, vertex attributes like UVs are. Here you can see some, some mistakes still. And we had even we had an lobster also, like... And then putting these... Uh, trying to put these vertex attributes, which is like the UVs or point attributes or vertex attributes, onto this mesh, which is basically a volume. So these were first fluid meshing tests and then flip fluids Houdini. It looks very complicated, but basically it isn't because they did such a great job that you just, the software that does anything for you. So you just have to yeah, change a little bit of some parameters. Here were some density and, and viscosity tests basically to get that to get the look that we wanted. Here are some meshing tests. Yeah, and then well, we had some sound design. A good friend of mine, Michael Fakes, which I know from, I don't know, long years, uh, we asked him to do the, the sound and he was extremely eager and motivated to do it. So we did it. I don't know, uh, do I have to plug in the audio jack or does it by HDMI? Stop. <laughs> so I hope this works now with the audio. If not, I'll just try it again. No. Sorry, my fault.
Yeah, that was the sound design. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it for me. So thank you very much. And yes. I just heard I got four minutes left. Yes. So if you got questions, I hope to be able to answer them. If not, I'm glad to finish this because it was quite chaotic and quite nervous. <laughs> but you can just go ahead with questions if you have, have some. Uh, all together, I think, poof, I don't know exactly, maybe 12, 15, something like that, because we had these act actresses and these photo scan people, but the core team was like, I think, 10 to 12 people or so. Yes, and we worked like, I don't know, maybe four months all together on this project. So I would say... How did you handle the regular job as <laughs> The what? The what? Yeah, we just risked it. We just did it. We had just we have not bucked off and try say as a <laughs> You just have to do it, otherwise you never do. So and then in the end you'll get like eighty five years old and it's like oh, I never did a free project. I always worked for coffee machines. My life is so bad. <laughs> Fuck it. Just do it. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. That's it.